Hey there! Did you know Kroger always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Kroger app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Kroger today. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Hey everyone, Ray here. I've got another book recommendation for you, and I think you're going to like this one. Adolf Hitler spent much of his early life in Linz, Austria, and considered it his hometown. As dictator, he planned to remake Linz into the cultural capital of the German Reich, placing stolen artistic treasures from across Europe in a grand museum there, which made it the perfect symbolic and strategic bomber target for the Allies. A new book, Bombing Hitler's Hometown, The Untold Story of the Last Mass Bomber Raid of World War II in Europe, is the never-before-told true story of the white-knuckled mission by the U.S. 15th Air Force to bomb Linz. Drawing on interviews with more than 50 survivors of the raid and previously in published sources, author Mike Croissant puts the reader right there alongside the last of America's greatest generation with intense action sequences within the new ME-262 jet as well as B-24 and B-17 heavy bombers. It provides a unique perspective of Austrian soldiers and civilians under the bombs who were caught up in events beyond their control. Bombing Hitler's hometown also provides groundbreaking scholarship on a previously untold story, the repatriation of freed Allied prisoners of war from the port of Odessa in Soviet Ukraine, a city that has been in the headlines this year due to Russia's war in Ukraine. Retired U.S. Army General David Petraeus calls this book an extraordinary story and a page-turning thriller as well. Bombing Hitler's Hometown, from Kensington Publishing, is available everywhere books are sold. Hello. And thank you for listening to the history of World War II podcast, episode 458, The Trapped Soviet Soldiers at Uman. Last time, Hitler and Chief of Staff of the Army High Command, General Franz Halder, were in disagreement about what to do next, now that the Stalin line had been pierced, but not shattered, though that was coming soon. And during this agreement of where to focus the bulk of Army Group South, to set up their next thrust east, Colonel General Ewald von Kleist, commander of the 1st Armored Group, took the lead, as some of his panzers were now mere miles from Kiev's western edge. Furthermore, these elements of the 13th Panzer Division were joined by the 14th Panzer and the 25th Motorized Division. Thus, it looked as if the capital of the Ukraine would fall, as had so much Soviet territory so far. And yet... There's a difference between what seems inevitable on a map versus standing on that same ground. For geography always has a say. Always. But because the Panzers had rushed forward, much of their artillery and infantry support were still miles behind. So should the attack on Kiev wait to allow for a stronger attack or go now, lacking much but going in before the seemingly numberless Russians pour even more men into that city. That would be decided by the man on the ground, General Eberhard von Mackensen, commander of the 1st Panzer Army. What would have helped to make this an easier decision to say yes, attack now, was if von Reichenau's 6th Army could have approached Kiev from the north with most of its strength, but they could not. For Poptopov's Soviet 5th Army, who had been engaging the German 6th, had retreated a bit to the north, into the Pripet Marshes. Yet, they had the temerity to pop out now and again and attack the left flank of the 6th from time to time. So, von Reichenau, besides his bad heart, could never fully turn his attention to the south. Thus, he and his could not be the factor they might have been. So, by the second week of July, three major German forces were about 10 miles, or 16 kilometers, west of Kiev's border. But, as von Mackensen looked down at his feet, he was on the ground there, he noticed a relatively small river, but also a swamp. 
and that swamp extended out to about a kilometer to either side of the Urban River. And two kilometers is a lot to expect panzers to get through all the while fighting and being fired upon. They would be forced to stick to the roads. But if the enemy knew which way they were going to approach, well, all kinds of obstacles could be put into place. Von Mackensen's instincts told him to get started before the city could be further reinforced. At that moment, political commissar N.S. Khrushchev, the future leader of the Soviet Union, was in command of the garrison protecting Kiev, and with him were three rifle divisions of regular infantry, an airborne brigade, a tank regiment, some NKVD motorized forces, the 1st Kiev Artillery School, two anti-tank battalions, and about 29,000 militia. Impressive. But for the Germans, it was still a more pressing matter of being able to deal with those swamps. But on July 11th, the same day that the panzer crews of the 13th could just see the spires jutting out of Kiev, Lieutenant General Kurpanos, the southwestern front commander, met with his staff and was convinced, or convinced himself, that 1st Panzer Group was coming for Kiev, and soon. However, within hours of Kurpanos making this declaration, Hitler ordered von Kleist to stop and to not attack Kiev. Meanwhile, at Army Group South's headquarters, Field Marshal Walter von Braulich, C&C of the German Army, stated that, again, there were not enough panzers to both take Kiev and encircle the growing Soviet threat in the south, near Uman. Army Group South's commander, von Rundstedt, agreed with this, while von Reichenau, to the north and busy fighting those small clashes, but still respected, not only agreed, but said to split their forces and attack both cities would lead to a Verdun-like stagnant fighting at both locations, the exact opposite of the spirit of Blitzkrieg. Then Hitler's Directive No. 21 took over. As it ordered, a priority for now was the destruction of Soviet forces in the south, thanks to Bunyani's massive attempt in counterattack there, near Uman, for that's where the panzers were ordered to go. They would encircle this building Soviet front and then smash it. This would satisfy Hitler's directive while reducing the number of defenders that could come to the aid of Kiev when it was attacked. Thus the panzers, as best they could, temporarily laid siege to Kiev to keep the defenders there tied down. Meanwhile, those large guns and infantry were on their way, and they arrived on the scene, having fought their way through their part of the Stalin line, in late July. So the 3rd Panzer Corps began to pull out of the siege line near Kiev to be replaced by the 6th Army. Now, all of this movement was not made easy, as Khrushchev never slackened his own guns on the closest enemy troops. As the panzers pulled back from Kiev, Kurpanis believed he and his had just stopped a German advance on the city. Little did he know that von Kleist's panzers would be heading south to Uman. Yes, it was a less ambitious target, but it was decided that Kiev wasn't going anywhere as was the Great Bend in the Dnieper River. No, better to destroy tens of thousands of Soviet troops and then reassess the overall situation. But when the 1st Panzer Group was about 40% on its way to Uman, they stopped near Balea Zerkov. This sudden change split the 5th and 6th Soviet armies as they tried to react. Kurpanis reacted by having all air forces under his command hit the Germans there. To be sure, the Germans would still advance to the south, but right now, we're dealing with local resistance. As for the Stavka, they finally figured out what the enemy was up to. By taking Uman first, then Kiev. Then they could focus on crossing the Dnieper River to the east and any other waterway to the southeast of Uman, like the River Bug. So, the Stavka did as they had been doing since early on, forming armies out of what they had to hand. The Soviet 26th Army was formed from the 4th Rifle and 5th Cavalry Corps, just across the Dnieper River to the northeast of Uman by about 175 kilometers or 108 miles. 
More specifically, if a line is drawn to the east from both Kiev and Uman, in between them, along the Dnieper, there is a city called Cherkasy, and from there, the new 26th Army would cross around July 15th and head west. The Stavka was thinking, by the time the Germans did get to wherever it is they were going exactly after leaving Belaya Zerkov and then continue south, this would allow this new 26th Army to make their way west enough so they would end up just behind the panzers pushing on to Uman. And with such an advantage, not only could the panzers' supply lines be cut, but the very machines themselves giving the Germans their advantage could be gutted from behind. But, alas, nothing was going right for the southwestern front. For example, the Germans had just become aware of this very plan when a Soviet reconnaissance plane landed in territory they controlled. So forthwith, von Rundstedt had Group Schwelder. Remember that part of the German 6th Army that had been split by the charging panzers of the 13th Division heading to Kiev? They then formed their own unit. Well, they were now tasked with keeping this rescue operation back while Uman was being encircled. The Soviet 26th Army crossed the Dnieper on July 18th and headed west as ordered. But they did not get too far, because they ran into a trap set for them by the Schwelder Group. But as the size of the Soviet force was much larger than expected, the Germans were having trouble containing this Soviet cavalry charge. This forced von Kleist into weakening his panzer charge to the south to get to the eastern or southeastern area of Uman to help the encirclement. Instead, he told the 48th Panzer to continue heading south, but that the 14th Panzer was to stop and face east. They would support the Schwelders Group task of keeping the 26th away from helping those trapped at Uman. And thus weakened, the 48th Panzer pushed on, but then was slowed by constant air attacks and constantly being ready to receive an attack on the ground from the east or south if the enemy forces near Uban decided to go on the attack as had happened so many times so far. Not until July 21st did this lone panzer corps reach Monaterista, located about 40 kilometers or 24 miles to the northwest of Uman. Obviously, they had not reached their target location. On one hand, not 24 hours before they reached this city, Marshal Bunyeni himself, the overall commander of both the southwestern and southern fronts, had made this his headquarters, and he had laid his head down here. Now, he was retreating to the east. On the other hand, as large sections of the now trapped, as there were panzers below them, the 6th Army was close by, so they were ordered to attack the 48th Panzer with a view of creating an escape corridor. These Russians who attacked lacked many things like adequate artillery and air cover, but they gave it all they had, which forced von Rundstedt to send in the 11th and 16th Panzer as well as the 16th Motorized Division. But even this was not enough to stop the fanatical Russians who were trying to fight their way to freedom. So the Liebstandata Adolf Hitler and SS Division was also sent to the area and together Though it took until July 25th, the Russians were finally kept in check and would soon be renewing their attack against the Soviets. But first things first, Uman. Even after all these panzer-heavy reinforcements, it still took two more days to confirm that the desperate Soviet 6th could not impede them. Some of the panzers were allowed to start heading south again to finish the encirclement around Uman. The 14th Panzer Corps once again headed south, while the 13th Panzer, they were ordered to follow the 14th, but on their left or east side to cover their eastern approach. Join us today during the Jeep Celebration event for great deals on Jeep brand SUVs. Right now, well-qualified lessees get a low mileage lease on the 2024 Jeep brand Cherokee Laredo 4x4 for 429 a month for 39 months with 3,759 due at signing. Tax, title, license extra, no security deposit required. 
Call 1-888-925-G for details. Requires dealer contribution and lease through Stellantis Financial. Extra charge for miles over 32500 Not all customers will qualify. Residency restrictions apply. Take delivery by 4-1. Jeep is a registered trademark. But then it got worse for the Russians. To the south of Uman, the river Bug runs diagonally. If looking at a map of Uman, it goes from the upper left corner to the right lower corner. And here, von Stupenegel's 17th Army, with the 1st Mountain Division leading the way, was crossing the Bug. And the Hungarian Fast Corps were covering the Germans' left or northern flank, which meant by August 2nd, the Kessel around Uman was practically closed. It had been the Stavka's plans to stop all enemy forces from crossing the Bug, but this emergency of defending Kiev and stopping the Panzers from reaching Uman soaked up many of the Soviet forces between the southwestern and southern fronts. And though the Germans and Romanians lost numerous horses on their trek by July 27th, they were over the river and into open territory. The approaches to the Crimea were now all but open to them. Lieutenant General Tulunev, commander of the Southern Front, saw what was coming and ordered his 18th Army, during its retreat east, to head to a location just southeast of Uman, but obviously closer to the city than the building German circle. And the 18th Army moved faster than the pursuing elements of the German 11th Army and Romanian 3rd Army. Well, mostly, some of them would end up being cut off and surrounded. The good news was that the 18th Soviet didn't find a full circle, more like a half a circle, but mostly to the north and east, though it was building to the south. When this was reported, Tulunev ordered the 4th Mechanized Corps, his second and last Mechanized Corps, to create a corridor The 4th Mechanized engaged the Germans to break out starting on July 31st, but their move was predictable enough, and without enough tanks, their speed and punching power lacked what they needed. Though they gave the Germans more than one fright, they could not punch a hole to let their comrades retreat further east. Their resistance ended by August 3rd. Learning that they had failed, Bunyene told the Stavka, all efforts to withdraw the 6th and 12th armies to the east and northeast are fruitless. And it only got worse when Flieger Corps 5 sent in wave after wave of Stuka bombers, and two a bit further south, the 16th Panzer Division captured a major bridge over the bug, allowing German forces there to consolidate. With that being the case, Southern Front Commander Tulunev ordered Musichenko and Ponidian, the commanders of the 6th and 12th Armies respectively, to simply fight their way out. There were many other units in this area, but it was hoped at least these two had the ability to save themselves. Thus, a massive moving battle ensued. The area controlled by the two trapped Soviet armies was reduced as the days went by, as the Germans fired more artillery shells in only four days than during the entirety of the Western Campaign in 1940. No surprise, by August 8th, the Kessel, or Pocket, had been reduced, and the resistance was practically over. Berlin could now brag about another massive bag of enemy troops, specifically 103,000 Russians from 25 different divisions, along with 317 tanks, 858 artillery pieces, and 242 anti-tank and AA guns. This was made all the worse by an additional 100,000 dead Soviet troops, whose bodies were spread all around Uman. And in this heat, disease would soon be rampant. As for that rescue party, the Soviet 26th Army, they tried again to push west on August 7th, but Flieger Corps 5 sent squadrons at them. In three days, those German planes destroyed 94 enemy tanks, which clearly reduced the effectiveness of any help. Clearly, this wasn't going to happen, and so on August 10th, the Stavka gave up on holding any significant land 
west of the Dnieper, except for their forces at Odessa and Kiev. But that is another story. The 26th Army was told to fall back and hold the line. But being prudent, as the Soviets had tried to cross the Dnieper at the cherkassy kany area, this was where the Germans would choose to attack. Why? To make sure that no other rescuing forces crossed through here. So the Germans pressed on, which confused the Soviets as they were clearly retreating. The Germans had won the day. By August 21st, Group Schwelder had men along the Dnieper River in this area. The western bank now belonged to them. Another ten days of fighting would only increase how much of the western bank fell into German hands. Thus, in a relatively short time, that being July and early August, Army Group South had ravaged the southwestern sector and, though a bit less so, the southern front. Some 24 Soviet divisions had been shattered, and those rifle divisions that had survived and escaped to the southeast were now down to about half their normal number. Further, the Soviet defenders in this area had started with 5,465 tanks and 2,059 aircraft. Now they had a few hundred of each. To be sure, the southwestern front, having been pushed back hundreds of kilometers, still had over 700,000 men within their ranks. Of course, that was because they were new recruits, having just arrived on the scene. Still, it was now their turn to attempt to stop this juggernaut that was Army Group South. As for those relative few who escaped the Uman Kessel, they were forced to head south, and many of them would end up in Odessa to be a part of another siege. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. So, first of all, I wanted to apologize for the chainsaw in the background. It's my neighbor. I didn't know he was going to do that. So, again, sorry. Um, so, let's jump into saying hi to members and those who have donated. So, first of all, uh, members. Richard Burville from North Perth, Australia, is a new member. Richard Manzella from Aliquippa, Pennsylvania. I'm sure I butchered that, Richard. Sorry about that. Uh, let's see here. Michael Richard from St. Albans, Victoria, Australia. So Australia is definitely representing. And Dwayne Perry from Raleigh, North Carolina. And Dwayne donated. So again, you've heard this before. That makes Dwayne my new best friend. As far as those who have donated, let's see here. Uh, there's Kenneth Vaughn. Thank you very much, Kenneth. Mark K. He listens while he does his chores. So I I think in time he's going to associate me with hard physical labor. That can't be good. And then lastly, Sharon Kelly. But then I got a very nice email from a Tom M. He was talking about some things. He's from the UK. and He was talking about um, the different things that I've called the uh, the main island over the years. So from now on, instead of Britain, the British Isles, the UK, whatever. I'm just going to call it Tom's Island from now on. That I can remember. That I can pronounce. So let's just go with that. So from now on, Tom's Island is Britain. On a more serious note, um, I've uh, had some more uh, health issues uh, again, but my wife, Heather, who is a lot smarter than I am, said, um, for those who are still listening to you, Obviously, they you know they're they're they're, they're invested. I think, uh, and so you should give them details. So uh, coming up soon, I have a stress test for my heart. Um, my mother gave me the gift of gab. She also gave me a bad heart. So um, I've already got two stints in my heart. It looks like I'm going to be having a third, or maybe they're going to try something new. I don't know. But first, I got to do the stress test to confirm. So, and, and, um, to be completely open, honest, transparent, uh, when I first mentioned this sometimes, sometime last year, uh, some of you donated. Thank you very much. And so what I did was, um, I bought myself health insurance because by the time I do the stress test, by the time I do the stint and all the other tests they have to do, it's going to be, It's going to be a pretty penny. This is America, after all. It's going to be tens of thousands of dollars. Hell, it was tens of thousands of dollars when I did it 12 years ago. Anyway, so um, instead of buying beer, which I really, really like to do, or cigars, I bought health insurance. So as soon as I have the stress test, I'll update you. And again, those who donated, 
Thank you so much. I, I really do. You'll never know. Thank you so much. So anyways, you, I will, I will let you know what happens. Um, but first I'll have to go take my shirt off. They'll shave strategically shave parts of my chest, attach a whole bunch of wires. And then I get to run on a tre- treadmill. Yay. Anyway, so I'll keep you updated. And there you, you have everything that I've been dealing with for the last year. So um, I'm sorry for the delay in this one, but it was because of the little relapse or whatever the technical term is of my heart, had some trouble, but back now. And uh, so hopefully we can get back on a more smooth schedule. As always, take care, everyone.